Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2012 Class Day Exercises. My name is Bonnie Tao. I'm a proud resident of Fort Zimmer House. <laughs> and I'm honored to be your first class marshal. I am very excited to welcome you to Class Day which, depending on how you look at it, marks the beginning of two very full days of commencement activities, or the end of one very great week of class unity and class debauchery. On this day, we have the chance to reflect as an undergraduate community on these past four years with the people who have shaped them the most. Coming to Harvard, our lives changed forever. As a Southern Californian, coming from a public high school of 4,000, this place took a lot of getting used to. But soon enough, it became a place that I couldn't and still can't really imagine ever leaving. Our hollowed brick dorm soon became the yard. We learned that the Science Center was a place of learning and not just a hurricane relief shelter. Pinocchios became Noakes, Domna became legend, and roommates became family. Today is the day of acceptance that tomorrow we will officially become alumni of this esteemed institution. And the understanding that no matter where we end up in life, we'll always be Harvard grads. But if these past four years have been any indication, this is a class that is rarely satisfied with the bare minimum, unless it's senior spring. The next few years are a test not just of how well we can survive in the real world, but of how willing we are to challenge it, to change it, and to follow our passions, throw ourselves outside of our comfort zones, and to succeed and to fail gloriously. Today is also a day for us to celebrate. But let's be honest, we've been celebrating all year. So we must realize that class day means something even more. Looking back on four years of classes, meetings, and senior theses, as students, we've worked hard to get to this day and to walking through this theater tomorrow in our cap and gowns. But I, for one, must admit that the work my parents have done, supporting me every step of the way, is far greater than the cumulative total of any work I have done here or to get here. Our successes, honors, and tomorrow our diplomas are a reflection of the hard work of those friends and family members sitting with us today, and of those who couldn't be here with us, just as much as they are a reflection of what we have achieved ourselves. You are our teachers, our guiding lights, and our inspirations. Today, we celebrate the work that everyone here has done to make our graduation tomorrow possible. Class of 2012, you are some of the most extraordinary people I have ever met, and I am honored to call you my classmates and my friends. Thank you for making these past four years some of the most challenging, humbling, and incredible years I could have ever hoped for. Congratulations and welcome class of 2012. Today is your day. Thank you, Bonnie. My name is Annie Douglas, and I'm a proud member of the class of 2012 and resident of Adams House. I'm honored to introduce our class day's first esteemed guest. The next speaker joined the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in 2002 and began her tenure as Dean of Harvard College in June of 2008. We met her three months later in a raincoat in the Science Center, where we all sought shelter from the storm during our first night on campus. 
Prior to her appointment as dean, she served as Harvard University's first senior vice provost for faculty development and diversity. Also, she continues to serve as the Barbara Gutman Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science and of African and African American Studies. Before coming to Harvard, she taught at our neighbor institution, a fine accredited vocational school down Massachusetts Avenue, <laughs> where she was the founding director of the Center for Diversity in Science, Technology, and Medicine. Her scholarly interests include the intersections of history, science, medicine, gender, and race. She earned her first two degrees in her hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Spelman College, and a second Bachelor's in Electrical Engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. She continued her education here in Cambridge and received a Master's in Physics from MIT and a Doctorate in the History of Science right here at Harvard. It brings me great pleasure to invite to the podium not only a scholar of both the sciences and the humanities, but also someone who cares deeply about the undergraduate experience. Please join me in welcoming Dean Evelyn Hammonds. Thank you, Annie. Good afternoon, seniors. Okay, that's good. So yes, today is your day, and congratulations to each member of the graduating class of 2012. I'm so very happy to be here with you today to celebrate and share your last full day as a Harvard College student. But I have to tell you that I'm a little sad today as I feel that we are at the end of a journey we have been on together. When I began my tenure as Dean of the College in 2008, you entered as freshman. And that year was as large and looming for me as it was for all of you. As Annie just noted, we met in the midst of a rainstorm, almost hurricane, in the Science Center. So what a beginning we had. But today, four years later, here we are celebrating one of the brightest days of your lives. And I hope you have cherished and enjoyed this journey. I hope your memories are of the excitement you felt from learning, the rush you got from conquering hurdles, and the joy you experienced when you made a house full of strangers your friends. Please cherish those memories and friendships because they are Harvard's gift to you. Now, I also want to thank your family members and loved ones who are joining you here today. They've waited a long time, and many have traveled a long way to witness this occasion. And as a parent, I believe it is one of the most wonderful joys to see your son or daughter achieve great things. And this is a day when we are honoring your great achievements. So candidates of the class of 2012, your parents and loved ones will spend the next hours and days taking photos, showering you with doting accolades. Please indulge them in every moment of it. They are incredibly proud of you. For their contribution to your success, let us all here today give them a loud and appreciative round of applause. Today, you're still Harvard College students, and class day is a celebration of the end of your careers as undergraduates. But this is also an introduction to your new lives as Harvard College alumni. So today's proceedings are to be joyful and fun, but I also hope they will give you an opportunity to reflect upon all you have accomplished while here at Harvard, both inside and outside of the classroom and on the friends you've made here. Tomorrow, the university will wish you well on your great journey ahead, but today, you as the class of 2012 will spend time commemorating your four years at the college. I have a suspicion uh, that many of you already started uh, celebrating that part earlier this week. So uh, I think you'll write, continue for the next few hours enjoying yourselves. As you know, Harvard is an institution filled with tradition. And each year, the dean of the college uses this moment to preview the traditions that we will renew tomorrow. Several of my predecessors have offered the following description of tomorrow's events. So the commencement ceremony is a wonderfully ritualistic occasion, full of incantation and free of explanation. It will all go very quickly, I promise you. 
Now, during the commencement exercises, the President will confer the degrees upon the university's graduates. First, the PhD and master's degrees are called, then the professional schools in the reverse order of their founding dates will be acknowledged. They'll make little cheers, they'll have special props, you know, the business school people always throw money in the air. Uh, the college will come last and we get to show them how it should be done. And here is some discreet coaching on how we can make some noise. When Harvard College is called, I hope you will take the opportunity to inform the graduate and professional school students about which school is the true jewel in Harvard's crown. And make sure they can hear you all the way into the square. So I will begin with the salutation, Madam President and Fellows of Harvard College. So this refers to Drew Gilpin Faust and the Fellows of the Harvard Corporation. They form the legal entity that is Harvard University. Then I will greet Madam President and members of the Board of Overseers. And this refers to the second governing body of our university and its president. After these salutations, I will say that you have fulfilled the faculty's requirements for the first degree in arts or in science. And I sincerely hope you have, because it is my responsibility as dean to see that it is so. And then finally, I will pronounce that each candidate stands ready to advance knowledge, to promote understanding, and to serve society. To advance knowledge, to promote understanding, and to serve society. Now, one person who won't be here with us uh, for this commencement ceremony is the Reverend Peter Gomes, who remarked on the founding of Harvard College. And he said, quote, now, I ask you to remember that noble purpose for which this old college was founded. It was not established simply to provide you with connections, contacts, or a job. Nor was it founded merely to give employment to professors and otherwise unemployable administrators. <laughs> it was founded rather on an idea and an ideal, with the idea that education was good for a new society and the ideal that such an education would be devoted to a moral purpose larger than personal gain or self-satisfaction. The purpose of Harvard College, he concluded, was moral, designed to make the world and ourselves better than we are. These are noble and ambitious goals. I do hope you will heed them. You join all of the classes who have studied on these ancient and hallowed grounds, and you are part of a great continuum that goes back 375 years. We have all struggled to achieve these goals in our lives, and now it is your turn. I'm excited to see what amazing things you will do in the years to come. Each of you has unique talents and an incredible work ethic that has brought you to this point in your life and to this very moment in Harvard's Tercentenary Theater. And when I think on your extraordinary achievement today, I see enormous potential in all of you. I hope you will stay in touch, as does the alumni office, and you will hear from them about a specific kind of comp contribution. But I want you to stay in touch with us here at Harvard to make another kind of contribution. I got a very sweet note from one of you saying that they'd miss seeing me around the yard. And I will miss seeing all of you as well. But just because we won't bump into each other in person does not mean we have to be out of touch. We need to hear from you more than ever before. As you leave us and begin your new journey, you will experience life in a fast-changing, interconnected global society. As we all know, technology changes our lives more and more quickly. Even 10 years ago, we did not connect through social media the way we do today. At Harvard, we will need your insights as our global society rapidly advances. You will be out there, on the ground, so to speak, and your observations will help inform our responses to this rapidly changing world. Of course, you can always send a check to, but I hope you will be free, feel free to teach us here at Harvard as much as we've tried to teach you. Remember that Harvard will always be here for you. One of, the mo one of our most famous alumni, President John Kennedy, said on a visit here in 1954, quote, I can think of nothing more reassuring for all of us than to come again to this institution whose whole purpose is dedicated to the advancement of knowledge and the dissemination of truth. I urge all of you to come back again, to visit us often. We won't forget you. I hope you won't forget us. 
Now, tomorrow, my words to you will be words that I have been bestowed upon generations of Harvard students, and I will have to keep to the formal and time-honored text, but today I do not. And so I want to leave you on your last day at Harvard, as Harvard College students with these final words that I drew from Reverend Mayer's prayer on yesterday. Let us all be thankful for this time we have had together in this community of learning, for all the hearts and minds that search for truth and long for wisdom and thirst for justice. Good luck and congratulations. Thank you, Dean Hammonds. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Kim, and I'm the Courier House Representative on the Senior Class Committee. Today, I have the honor of introducing our two next speakers, who I have had the pleasure of getting to know this semester. They have played an integral part of bringing the senior class together, keeping the rest of the senior class committee members organized and on our toes, and worked closely with each of us to make our, our events successful. As secretary, Teddy Tiab helped facilitate the correspondences between all 28 senior class committee members, as well as the senior class committee and our 1,600 classmates. Bi-monthly newsletters, which Teddy cleverly dubbed the Dirty Dozen, helped convey essential information on everything from events like paintballing and scavenger hunts to logistical information on where to pick up commencement tickets. I know that I personally would have been very lost without Teddy by my side this year. Also integral on our committee is Puneet Shah, our webmaster. This past year, while writing a thesis, our webmaster created a beautiful website that announces information on the latest senior bars or who our, our class day speakers are. More importantly, for the class of 2012, Puneet created a program called Match 12, <laughs> a program that allowed seniors to anonymously crush each other and let them know if their crushes had crushed them back. Knowledge is power, and since Puneet probably has the ability to decode all of our crush lists, this man has a lot of power. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Teddy Tiab and Puneet Shah. Thanks, Kelly. My name is Teddy, and I am the senior class secretary and a proud resident of Kirkland House. <laughs> Nearly four years ago, we sat in this very place, entirely different people and complete strangers to one another. Even as we officially become alumni of Harvard, there is no denying that some of us are still strangers. But no longer could we ever be complete strangers. By virtue of the four years we spent within a mile's radius from here, the hours in our dining halls and libraries, the thousands of times we've walked through the gates of Harvard Yard, we've come to make, at the least, familiar faces of one another. As your class committee, we are charged with forever nudging you further away from being complete strangers and closer to being friends and family. Because like friends and family, it is our hope that the alumni network will be there for you when you need it. So do stay in touch. Look forward to future Harvard Yales in the alumni section. Look forward to our five-year reunion. Look forward to your classmates having your back and being at your side, as if you take a moment to look around you, you will notice they do and are now. While it's my honor to be in charge of being that guy that sends you emails and newsletter updates for the rest of my life, that's just one way of staying in touch, and it's a rather one-sided means of communication. To speak more about the benefits of using our other tools is our class webmaster, Puneet Shah. Thank you, Teddy. HAA offers a variety of tools to stay in touch with the university community at large, but I want to talk about how to stay in touch with the class of 2012 specifically. First, check out our class website at harvard12.org. Students are, of course, familiar with this website because of Match 12, but there are other features on the site as well. For example, Map 12. Here, you can enter your location where you will be next year and add yourself to the class map. Beyond finding roommates, it's a great way to connect with others who will be in the area. You can even sign up to be a city captain in rather, regardless of whether you're going to the smallest town or the largest cities across the country and world. 
Here, you'll be able to plan alumni events and meetups and help extend the magic of the Harvard community to wherever you are. By connecting with friends and potential new friends, we can have, we can have conversations over drinks or help talk about new ideas. <clears throat> and hopefully in the future with the website, there will be information about reunions and other future events. Through our Facebook group and website, there's no reason we can't be the best connected class ever. I look forward to seeing all of you in alumni life, both new and old friends. And while I may only have met some of you, and this may sound crazy, but in the words of the great Drew Faust, call me maybe. Thanks. <laughs>
but it's not an official event unless you do it. <laughs> and the only time anybody will remember you is if you screw it up real bad. <laughs> so I hope not to be too memorable on this occasion. We have other things to think about. But I will give you some, uh, some, some advice, um, drawing on my years. Uh, some of it is practical. You will, if you get into some line of work like mine, from time to time be invited to places where people want to pay you tribute and hope that they lock you in on a couple of things they're looking for. And they will try to seal that deal by giving you something, a mug, a t-shirt, <laughs> a plaque. I have one very important piece of advice based on experience. Never throw anything out within one mile of where it was presented to you. <laughs> you will find that very useful. Secondly, my niece Madeline is here, who is a junior. Uh, she is doing me the great favor. She has with me the kind of schleppy green carry-all I have, because one of the things I have learned is never give anybody else custody of something you're going to need if you want to leave early. <laughs> Madeline, I thank you. I will also give you some uh, advice about how, if you are in elected office, to stay out of trouble. Now, one way to stay out of trouble is, of course, to be perfect. Uh, for those of us who will find that hard, here are a couple of rules. One, and I know this goes counter to the culture of the young people today with all the electronics. Um, I learned this in City Hall in Boston in 1967. And if you read the stories of indictments of people who have done insider trading or other things, you will understand its impact. Never write when you can talk, never talk when you can nod, and never nod when you can wink. I advise you that. Now, I don't know how you make your Blackberry wink, but if I were you, I'd learn how to do it. I would also say, well, obviously, especially if you're in public office, you should be very law-abiding. If that isn't possible, there is a practical rule that is very, very important. Be sure that you obey every law that you have voted for. <laughs> you can do that, you're probably doing pretty good. I left myself some wiggle room. <laughs> then there is a question of how do you approach public policy. I will cite one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, whom maybe the parents, maybe in some cases the grandparents, will be familiar with. And he articulated a rule that I have found, it, it's a metric, it's a way to approach issues that I have found indispensable. His name was Henny Youngman. He was a great comedian, yeah, the audiences know him less and less. <laughs> and he was part of that comedy tradition of the 40s, 50s, and 60s when men made jokes about their mothers-in-law and their wives, etc. But he had one which was terribly profound and very funny. He did these kind of quick one-liners. How's your wife? Compared to what? <laughs> now, I'm pleased to be able to say that within two months, I will be able fully to make that my own, and I hope I will be asked, how's your husband? I'll be able to say, compared to what? <laughs> but I recommend to you, I cannot think of a public policy decision I have had to make where I don't keep in mind, compared to what? because I don't have the luxury of creating a new reality. And that then leads me into some semantic guys. First of all, do not, I'm a great believer in free speech. I wouldn't let anybody say anything about anybody, including, by the way, and I would just add to that remark I made to the woman whom I compared unfavorably to a dining room table. Um, <laughs> she had asked me why I was supporting a health care policy of President Obama, which was based on the Nazi philosophy. And I did not consider that to be the kind of question that re required a civil answer. But I also went on to say that I am a great believer of the First Amendment, and I was glad that she had the right to say something so contemptible without any fear of, uh, of any penalty. So I'm not for limiting what anybody says about anybody. Uh, I supported strongly a hate crimes bill which amended the hate crimes law by adding sexual orientation, gender identity to the lists of motives that could enhance a sentence. 
Some of my colleagues said, well, but some of their ministers had said that would endanger their ability to say anti-gay things from the pulpit. And my answer was no. We are not trying to criminalize speech. We couldn't if we wanted to. We don't want to. This is only an added sentence enhancement for an otherwise criminal act. And I said, let me be very clear. I was at that time chairman of the Financial Services Committee. If this bill passes tomorrow, it will still be entirely legal to call me a fag. I just wouldn't recommend it if you're in the banking business. <laughs> but there are some things I would at least discourage. First of all, please do not ever use the words pragmatic and idealistic as if they were opposites. If you are in public life and you are doing things that make people follow your policies, then you better be idealistic. You have no justification for that unless you are trying to make it a better world. But once you have a set of ideals, you are morally obligated to be pragmatic. What good are a set of ideals that are unrealized? They make you feel better, but they don't feed a hungry child or clean up a river or do anything to help anybody whatsoever. So I urge you, please, Make sure that you are pragmatic in the service of your idealism and don't consider them opposite. Secondly, never use metaphors in the debate on public policy, particularly in foreign policy. There are no dominoes. Countries do not fall over and hit each other. One of the great minds of my time, Winston Churchill, debated whether or not to invade Europe through northern France, which was ultimately successful, or to do what he wanted to do, which was to go through the Mediterranean, attacking what he said was the soft underbelly of the Axis. Someone finally said to him, you know, Winston, the southern coast of France is no softer than the northern coast of France. Just because on a map it may vaguely resemble an animal is irrelevant. And people <laughs> debate metaphors and take them as reality. Metaphors mislead you. Please try to avoid them. One other plea I would make, please do not use partisan, referring to political parties, as if it was a bad thing. Uh, I was going to be an academic before I went into politics. You may, if you followed more closely than anyone ought to, the introduction, wonder whether the introducer misspoke or whether the program did when it said that I graduated from the college in 61 and the law school in 77. 16 years is kind of a long stretch. Well, the answer is in the interim, I was going to be an academic. And I will give you one other piece of advice to graduating uh, seniors. Try to find a line of work, if you can, where your personal characteristics are strengths and not weaknesses. And we all have characteristics. There can be a strength in one context and a weakness in another. I was <coughs> going to be an academic and write a PhD thesis. I was here enrolled in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. The program gracefully notes that I attended the GSAS with no degree noted. That was kind of them. It's because I didn't get one. <laughs> After a while, I left the academic world not having completed a thesis and went into politics. And I did it because I learned a lot about myself and I recognized that I had one characteristic that was a drawback in an academic but a great advantage in a politician. I have a very short attention span. <laughs> if I were you, I probably would have already lost track of what I'm saying. <laughs> the notion that you should try to overcome your weaknesses and force yourself to do what you're not good at has never made a great deal of sense to me. It always reminds me of the scene in Blazing Saddles where the uh, protagonist points a gun at his own head and marches himself off to jail to save himself from an angry mob. You can't live holding a gun to your own head. Try and go with your strength. But during that period, I did study a lot about democracy, and I am convinced of one thing, and this is very serious. There has never been a self-governing polity in the history of the world where you did not have political parties. Not because anybody wanted to create them, but because that is a natural tendency when people come together to avoid it just being personality. And that's especially important today. The political parties in America today are deeply divided on issues, more divided than they should be, in my view, but a fundamental divide is legitimate. And my one concern about President Obama, whom I greatly admire, during his campaign in 2008, was when he announced he was going to govern in a post-partisan manner. Frankly, I knew the other side, and I did not think that would be possible, 
and I feared he would lose out in trying. And I told the member of his staff that when he talked about governing in a post-partisan manner, he gave me post-partisan depression. <laughs> I think he's experienced a little of it himself. Finally, I want to make one serious note. I have in my pocket the most important commencement speech ever given. I thought I'd look at it. It was given by Secretary of State George Marshall at the Harvard commencement in June 5, 1947, when he announced the Marshall Plan. By the way, for those of us who are commencement speakers, here it is in its entirety. Every commencement speaker ought to know that George Marshall changed the world in two pages. Single space, but still two pages. And I cite it, one, to tell you how deeply flattered I am to be speaking the platform, although his speech was the tomorrow afternoon speech, but I'll take uh, eminence by association, even with some, with some distance. But it's a very important speech. It was a speech in which he announced the decision by the United States under Harry Truman, with some bipartisanship in the Senate, to go to the aid of a Europe that had been devastated by World War II, that was poor and hungry and defenseless and facing a brutal Soviet Union. And for the intervening period, America has been a strong defender of Europe. But you know, that was 1947. We're 65 years later. Too little has changed in our policy. By the way, if you go back in time from Marshall's speech in 1947, as far as we are ahead from that time, the President of the United States is Chester Arthur. A lot changed between the days of Chester Arthur and Harry Truman. A lot's changed between Harry Truman and our day. There are people here, graduates, who will leave far more heavily indebted than a decent society ought to have made you do. There are young people who didn't get the education they could get because of that. We have needs that we are not addressing to improve the quality of our life. And part of that is that we are still treating our friends and now our economic equals in Europe as if they are our wards. So I've decided today I want to announce not simply that I congratulate the Harvard students graduating, but I think it's time for us to announce the graduation of Europe, 65 years after George Marshall's wonderful speech. The notion that America has to be the military bulwark for Europe, the notion that our European allies can have very little in the way of military spending because they can count on America to defend them, the notion that we have to have American troops in Europe and the Sixth Fleet as their major bulwark, it's commencement time. And there are places in the world where people need our help. But our continued treating Europe as a dependent and we don't do it anymore economically with the Marshall Plan, that part of it. But the other part of the Marshall Plan was a military decision. At the time, and now we go to 1949 in NATO, Europe was poor and weak, and the Soviet Union was brutal. And while it was poor, Stalin was able to mobilize with that oppressive society all of the resources to be military threatening. And so what we did, the United States, was to step in and protect poor and weak Europe from the brutal and aggressive Soviet Union. There is no longer a poor and weak Europe. There is no longer a brutal and aggressive Soviet Union. There's still a Russia, not my favorite country. I continue to be grateful my grandparents got the hell out of there. <laughs> but it is not anything like what it was 60 some odd years ago. The only thing that hasn't changed is that America continues to commit tens of billions of dollars that we could otherwise use for very important purposes to improve the quality of lives both here and elsewhere as if they still needed us. So I close by uh, expressing my deep sense of honor that I share a platform 65 years later with one of the great men in American history, George Marshall, and a commemoration of one of the great unselfish undertakings in American history. But the time has come to say it was a success. The time has come to declare victory. I read this, and I read about poor Europe, and I look at Europe today, and I say, good, it worked. So I close with this, for those of you who are about to go out and enter the political world. We have a decision to make as a country. Do we continue to act as if, in the aftermath of World War II, 
we had a requirement that we spend hundreds of billions of dollars a year, not simply protecting ourselves and our vital interests and some who need us, but whether we were going to spend all that money to be the dominant power everywhere in the world all the time, even when people don't need us. Because understand that's a choice. We cannot do that. We cannot continue that policy and still maintain a commitment to improving the quality of our lives at home. And so when people say to you, we cannot afford to do these things that I think many of you want to see done, I ask you to put that into the balance. And I would say, to quote myself, when I look at what we could do with some of those funds while still reducing a deficit, to improve the quality of life here at home, to spread education more widely, to improve the environment, to improve our physical life, to support health research and all those other important things. Compared to what? Well, compared to continuing to act as if the rest of the world needed to shelter behind America and spend hundreds of billions of dollars far beyond our own legitimate needs on that purpose. I hope that is an issue with which you will engage, and I look forward to at least some of you being on our side as we write the balance. Happy commencement. Thank you, Congressman Frank. I was expecting wisdom mixed with, mixed with hilarity, and you delivered. We found your speech both pragmatic and idealistic. And we hope that you're not going to throw out the Harvard 12 sweatshirt that we just gave you. Good afternoon, class of 2012. <laughs> it's fleece. It's fuzzy. Good afternoon, class of 2012, friends and family. My name is B.A. Salah of Elliott House. And I'm Annie D'Angelo of Fort Timer House. And we're two of your class marshals. And, and we, we have also the have the same, same birthday. birthday. <laughs> Harvard is the land of tradition. There is the tradition of morning prayers, which take place each morning and have since the college was founded. There's a tradition of academic excellence. There is the tradition of playing football against Yale in November. And our class has had the tradition of winning every single time. <laughs> And of course, there's the tradition of hundreds of students running naked the night before exams begin. So, what do prayer, academic excellence, football, and organized public nudity have in common? History. At a place as old and rooted in history as Harvard, it is through these many strong traditions that we are able to celebrate a shared experience, a bond between past, present, and future college grads. Today, in honor of the 375th celebration, we are lucky enough to revive one of these great traditions, that of class colors. Class colors actually began during the late 1800s as a way for different classes to differentiate among themselves during sports competitions. As Harvard as a college began to officially accept um, or adopt the color crimson, um, individual classes sought out ways to carve out their own identities. Um, and to help fans, families, and other players identify and follow class-based teams during rival games. In those days, Yale, Dartmouth, and Princeton were the main academic and athletic rivals of Harvard. Students from the sophomore, junior, and senior classes came up with the idea of stealing flags of each of these aforementioned institutions, giving the three, colors, giving the three classes each a color, blue, green, and orange. At commencement, the seniors would pass down the particular color to the freshmen, or rising sophomores, who would then adopt that color as their own. The colors were used to distinguish the classes, in everything from interclass football games and rowing races to reunions. This tradition continued until the 1960s, when it mysteriously faded out. As a matter of fact, Barney Frank's class, the class of 1961, was actually blue. We also have some alumni in the audience today who so proudly represent their blue banner, or their blue color, that they have an entirely blue class banner that they have displayed for over 50 years. Please join me in recognizing them.
And no, they are not some crazy Yaleys who snuck in here to experience a real class day. <laughs> Today, it gives us great pleasure to bring back this tradition, as the class of 2012 receives the color blue. As you can see, our class banner now sports the blue trim to celebrate the return of this great tradition. This color will be passed to the sophomores this fall um, by senior class representative, effectively restoring this amazing tie that binds us with classes and generations of alumni before us. Once again, congratulations to the class that is making history. The class, the class of 2012. 2012. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to see so many beautiful faces on such a beautiful day. My name's Michael Oberst, and I'm the Lowell House representative of the Senior Class Committee. Now, we just heard about an old Harvard tradition and its newfound revival, and on that subject of connecting the past to the present and to the future, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a man who is responsible for doing so much of just that. Carl Muller knows Harvard, as well he should, seeing as he holds degrees from not only the college, class of 1973, but also from the law school and from the business school. After Harvard, and Harvard, and Harvard, Carl went on to lead an illustrious career as a trial lawyer in South Carolina, which is his home state, if you can't tell from his propensity for bow ties. That experience, of developing persuasive and captivating stories has and will continue to serve him well as current first vice president and incoming president of the Harvard Alumni Association. In his new role as president, Carl is going to help shape alumni life in countless ways, both in Cambridge and around the world. Basically, it's kind of a big deal. So please, join me in welcoming Carl Muller. Good afternoon. Let me offer congratulations a day early on your newly minted Harvard degree. Mine from Harvard College is almost 40 years old. It was 1969 when I arrived at Harvard from a farm in the red clay hills of South Carolina. My life was one of self-reliance, largely in the outdoors, with the sun overhead, the wind in my face, and a touch of adventure. I could not wait to get to Harvard, Boston, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which since colonial times have been preeminent in American intellectual thought, politics, and commerce. It loomed as the greatest adventure that I could imagine. I came early to work cleanup on dorm crew before school started. Go dorm crew. <laughs> Compared to the wages on the farm, the money was fantastic. On the first payday, I sent part of my earnings to the H.L. Herter Company in Waseca, Minnesota, a mail order supply house that specialized in all manner of outdoor gear for everything from African safaris to polar expeditions. In those days, there was no Federal Express. Three weeks was the delivery time. I waited eagerly for the shipment. My roommates arrived, all from the Northeast, and classes began. Then late one afternoon, when I came back to our room in Wigglesworth, Ooh. cheers, cheers for Wigglesworth. <laughs> There awaited me a long tube from herders and three exceedingly curious roommates. I whooped, tore it open, and extracted a steel rod with a large, razor-sharp, rotating bronze tip. Their eyes grew wide, and one hesitantly asked, what is that? <laughs> a harpoon, I replied with glee. What are you going to do with it, asked another, edging toward the door. <laughs> Go whaling, of course, I said. <laughs> what? They exclaimed. You can't do that. 
I then explained that Nantucket was the whaling capital of the world, and I wasn't going to miss my chance. <laughs> a half hour later, they had me talked out of it. The whales were safe, and my roommates were thoroughly and irrevocably convinced that everything that they had heard about the South was true. <laughs> I tell you this partly for amusement, but primarily to illustrate the importance of the past. Wherever we go, we take the past with us. Even more, it is the past that takes us there. It is because of that farm in South Carolina that I came here decades ago and that I am here today. It is because of my family as we work the farm together and those who cleared the land and built the barns before us, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, and others who toiled there. To them, I owe the opportunity and experience that brought me here. Honor your past. Honor those who brought you to Harvard. Kiss your mother. Wrap your arms around your father. Offer a kind word to your little sister. And while you're at it, maybe rustle your kid brother's hair. Do that before you leave here today. Tomorrow, before you pack your things, honor those who got you through Harvard, the professors and tutors who taught you, the coaches who devised the strategies that helped you beat Yale, the dining hall staff who fed you, the buildings and grounds workers who swept the floors and kept the lights on, then, for the rest of your life, remember what they did for you here. As your four years at Harvard become part of your past, what shall you do with this remarkable gift? Use it to shape the world. I say the future because there is only one future, just as there is only one world for us all. You came to Harvard as citizens of 77 different countries you leave as citizens of one world. Answer the call that we sing in the last words of Fair Harvard. Be the herald of light and the bearer of love. Be what the world needs. Be that, and your own place in the future is assured. The past and the future, two times of life. The third time of life is the present. Embrace it. Now is when we forge the relationships that fulfill our dreams. Now is when we laugh and sometimes cry. Now is when we live. Enjoy the beauty of the world. Spend time with those you love and who love you. Never relinquish the feeling of your first day at Harvard or when spring at last comes to Cambridge. Bring that same wonder, excitement, and zest to each new day. Honor the past. Shape the future. Embrace the present. This is what the Harvard Alumni Association does. We do it in countless ways, most notably by hosting these festivities of commencement and class reunions, helping recruit and interview the members of each new freshman class and supporting almost 200 Harvard clubs around the globe. Like you, I love my four years at Harvard College. I stayed for another four, as this gentleman said, at Harvard Law School and Harvard Business School. My wife, who did not go to Harvard, jokingly calls it Preparation H. Another graduate of Harvard College who also loved his four years here is one of our most notable alumni, David Rockefeller, a member of the class of 1936. He was here recently and someone asked him why he had done so much for Harvard over the years. He said, Harvard opened my eyes to the world. How true. It begins when one arrives and continues for a lifetime. Stay connected. Keep up with your friends and your classmates. Come back for reunions, and every once in a while, just check in on the place to see how it's doing. 
The Harvard Alumni Association can help you with all of these things. For now, and until noon tomorrow, you are the rarest beings on the planet. You are graduating seniors at Harvard. You have finished exams, yet you are still undergraduates, which means that you can continue to get into a little mischief and talk your way out of it just as you have these past four years. You have 21 hours left to do as you please. Live it up. By the way, I still have the harpoon. When I get home, I shall paint it blue, my new class color. Be safe. Godspeed. We are proud of you. Hello, class of 2012. My name is Maya Pena, and I'm one of this year's senior gift co-chairs, along with A Alex Karabazovich, Ellie Hugh Reynolds, Elliot Rosenbaum, and Rashab Zingham. For the past eight months, we've had the pleasure and the honor of leading the 2012 Senior Gift Campaign. Working with a committee of over 150 of our classmates, we strove to educate seniors about the importance of giving back to Harvard. As we prepared for graduation and reflected on our time at the college, we've been struck by a profound sense of gratitude um, for graduation and reflected on our time together at the college. Um, <laughs> this year, our campaign focused on the importance of saying thank you. Today, as we celebrate the achievements of the class of 2012, we wanted to say thank you to each and every one of you for listening to us, reading all our emails, and considering the impact of a gift to Harvard College. We wanted to say thank you to the 1,180 seniors, over 78% of our class, who decided to contribute and who helped us raise the largest senior gift on record over $73,000. By giving back, we join a huge community of Harvard alumni whose generosity has helped make sure that Harvard can continue to thrive. Giving back to Harvard is a way to say thank you for all of the incredible opportunities we have been offered here. This year, we asked seniors to think about what has made their time amazing and to consider donating in order to help guarantee that future generations of Harvard students have just as much to enjoy. We asked each senior to submit a My 12 list along with their gift. And today, we would like to share with you our 12 the top responses from our class, and the 12 things that 2012 appreciated most about Harvard. You guys ready? Financial aid, housing day, marshmallow mateys at brain break, <laughs> Widener library, stacks, uh, housemaster open houses, blockmates, intramural sports, party shuttles, faculty dinners, study abroad, research grants, tourists in Harvard Yard, and the return of hot breakfast. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, all jokes aside, over the last five weeks, you have listened to us, and now it's time for us to listen to you. We will be passing along our My 12 list to the administration so they know what makes Harvard so great for its students, and so they can prioritize and continue to fund those parts of Harvard without which our time here would have been incomplete. We hope that Senior Gift is only the beginning of a tradition of giving back, and we thank all of the seniors who have already expressed their intention to continue giving. Our gifts today and the next few years have a huge impact. Older alumni look to us as recent graduates 
and as they're, as they're motivated and energized by our decision to give back as a vote of confidence and strength in the future of Harvard College. We thank you for your generosity and wish you all of the best in the days, months, and years to come. Congratulations, class of 2012. My name is Jeff Solnet, and I'm the Mather House representative on the Senior Class Committee. Not only does our next speaker hail from our opulent concrete fortress by the river, he is, he is also my roommate. Many of us know this sociology concentrator as the guy who enthusiastically encouraged others to dance together in Gungru, or as the president of the Harvard College Consulting Group or as the founder and CEO of a successful educational video game startup. However, I know him as the guy who tells really bad jokes in an effort to get you to laugh, sometimes while we're in the shower. <laughs> or as the guy who took a few hours teaching me how to correctly pronounce me tumse pr karta hu, or I love you in Hindi for a performance. But as we learned at Harvard, everyone leads a double life and everyone changes. I and about 1,113 lucky viewers on YouTube know him as the Mash Daddy, the, the, the budding rap sensation from Greeno Hall. After a quick glance at Facebook photos from 2008, you would never expect this bespeckled spelling bee champion from Texas would write songs like Dubstep Love with poetry like Overstated is Underrated, I'm Gonna Vindicate It. Here to vindicate his rap career with his Harvard male oration, confidence in a handful of dust, is my friend and roommate, Stephen Maheshwari. My father's best friend is enthusiasm. You see, my father has an insatiable, zealous ambition to be a great public speaker. As part of that quest to be a great public speaker, he joined a club called Toastmasters, which allows adults to join each other at weekly meetings in order to improve their public speaking skills. As a child, I sometimes accompanied my father to local Toastmaster meetings where the first order of business was that of enthusiasm. So you see, at the beginning of every meeting, each member would literally pick up a cheerleader's pom-pom from a table and with increasingly deafening and seemingly misguided declamation, they would yell, enthusiasm, enthusiasm is my best friend. Enthusiasm, enthusiasm is my best friend. Enthusiasm, enthusiasm is my best friend. Imagine 10-year-old me watching my dad mix in with these middle-aged men and women shouting at the top of their lungs. It might seem overwhelming, but that day, I stood up on that table, picked up my pom-pom, and gave it right back to them. Twelve years later, I stand before you a much more jaded human being than I was on that table at Toastmasters. I've had my accomplishments here, but I have also felt self-disappointment in the many types of experiences that Harvard has to offer, classes, internships, jobs, student groups, and even social relationships. But wait, I'm not the only one. Whether you parents out there are willing to admit it, many of your sons and daughters here today have had similar failures in college. Don't worry, we feel bad about it too. In fact, some of us know the feeling of failure all too well, that sensation of our heart plunging from our chest into the pit of our knotted stomach, a visceral visage of failure. And the word failure, that word is such a bummer to hear. It even has a depressing cadence, almost patronizing. Failure. It even implies that all fails are yours. 
fail your. <laughs> the thing about Harvard is that we see success and accomplishment, and it spans the corner, every single corner of this beatific ancient institution. We see animated Twitter updates about winning fellowships, chubby-cheeked freshmen effulgently ebullient about the excitement of getting into Mather House. We see status updates about snagging jobs at Goldman or McKinsey and excited dinner discussions of getting into Harvard graduate schools. But we don't hear about failure. It exists in the hushed silences, in our dining halls, in the fake, wary smiles at social gatherings, in the sulking, in the carols at Lamont, behind the alacrity of our answers in section. And most prominent about rejection and failure is that for many of us, Harvard is the first place we experience it. It is a jarring sensation that can erode 18 years of ambition and confidence, the same enthusiasm with which we stepped onto the yard. That numbing loss of confidence gives way to a pause. And then the inevitable fearful conclusion that we are the singular admission mistake. You see, we perceive our life at Harvard as a universe in a sandbox. Some can only see the fear of failure in a handful of dust. But I say it is equally easy to find confidence in that same handful of dust. Because even right now, on the most glorious and hallowed of days, when we leave an institution that is famous worldwide for grooming the philandering, sorry, I mean philanthropic, talented, inquisitive, worldly, sexy men and women, some of us may be on an introspective precipice. Some of us don't have jobs lined up after graduation. Some of us are still reeling from recent failures, social rejections, bad grades, insecurities, and hey, even senior spring. So why don't we let pessimism's persuasive posturing pour into your ears as you recall these painful memories. A legion of your internal voices, your insecurities, your fears, and your doubts may make you doubt your resolve, may make you doubt your capacity, and may attempt to trip you as you finally take a momentous step outside of Harvard and on to the next chapter of your life. Today, on the eve of what can't possibly be four years, at an institution that has taught us many literal lessons and some figurative morals, I entreat you to seek out motivation and enthusiasm in the wake of failure. I believe that the Toastmasters formula was onto something. We need enthusiasm in the face of fear, even if we don't count it as our best friend. Enthusiasm for the fear of venturing into a new city with no friends in a career you didn't necessarily expect, distant once again from your parents here today. T.S. Eliot says, even if not heard at all, you are the music while music lasts. I say, play loudly, because being overstated is definitely underrated. Be the music that drowns out the atonal buzz of your own internal uncertainty. Eminent innovator Steve Jobs once said, the single greatest revelation in his life was that he will die. We will die. So why spend this moment or the next letting the personal punches that Harvard has meted out challenge us in the next chapter of our lives? The great modern poet, Drake, supplements his philosophy. He says, you only live once, that's the motto, YOLO. <laughs> the aged among you may recognize this as carpe diem. So, while the 18 years of momentum we have built before Harvard may seem all for naught, the lesson is learned that we must persevere harder against the outrageous fortunes born by the slings and arrows of maturity. What you do next with your life will not follow a fixed path that we have followed up until now. The vast world we meet next imposes ambiguity. There are no set core or gen ed classes to choose from. There is no consistent HUDs menu to rely on. And the commute 
may even be farther than the plane ride between the river and the quad. <laughs> and this can offer a lot of pain and confusion, but I say the best gain made from pain is the reign of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm from the fact that we go to Harvard, you have worked hard to get here, and will in fact work even harder to raise ourselves to the next echelon of crazy awesomeness. It is not the fear of failure we seek in the sandbox of reality, but confidence we find in a handful of dust. Ravens linebacker Ray Lewis once said, wins and losses come a dime a dozen, but effort, nobody can judge effort because effort is between you and you. So let's take our Harvard wins and losses, use them for tomorrow and the day after and the day after that and for the rest of our lives. Class of 2012, I entreat you and implore you and ask you to realize that with your next step in this lifelong marathon, you ought to exclaim, enthusiasm, enthusiasm is my best friend. Enthusiasm, enthusiasm is my best friend. Enthusiasm, enthusiasm is my best friend. Thank you, class of 2012, and best of luck. Thank you, Stephen, for a very enthusiastic speech. Hello, everyone. My name is Leslie Ray, and I'm the House Representative for Forsheimer House. I thankfully have the pleasure of introducing someone that I met on the first day of school during the Harvard blackout, Pauline Mutamwinka. Pauline is a human evolutionary biology concentrator and a resident of Elliott House. Hailing from Kigali, Rwanda, she has been an active member in the Harvard African Students Association since her freshman year, recently serving on its board as the political action chair. She, also, she spent the past two summers interning with health NGOs in Tanzania as well as Liberia in the areas of HIV prevention and women's empowerment. In her free time, Pauline loves to dance and has participated in ballroom, African, as well as Southeast Asian dancing. If you're lucky, she may give you a demonstration. This past year, she also served as co-director of the Pan-African Dance and Music Ensemble. Besides dancing, she enjoys reading as well as writing children's stories and has written two children's stories for the Harvard College Stories for Orphans student group. So everyone, now let's a, take a trip down the rabbit hole with Pauline Mutemwinka. I had been at Harvard for a year when I decided to emulate my peers by adding a respectable quote to the end of my emails. <laughs> I eventually settled on one from Lewis Carroll's classic, Through the Looking Glass, from the scene in which Alice meets the Red Queen, who is running around in circles. When Alice asks her why she's running around in circles, the Red Queen responds, now here you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. I thought at the very least, this quote would show my recipients that I had read an acclaimed book. But I also chose it because it has personal significance. When I read about Alice as a child, I knew we were very different. She's English. I'm Rwandan, Kenyan, Ugandan, Tanzanian. She's a European with long blonde hair. I'm an African with a short black afro. She spends her afternoons reading books on a riverbank and playing games of croquet by herself. Never mind that she plays them by herself, I thought. What on earth is croquet? <laughs> I spent my afternoons doing back-breaking housework and feeding the chickens. You almost believed that, didn't you? <laughs> I 
was actually quite the irresponsible African daughter, spending most afternoons reading books and pretending to be a boy. So what do Alice's Wonderland experiences have to do with my time at Harvard? For starters, I think you will all agree that freshman year felt a bit like falling down a rabbit hole. I tumbled through those first months, trying to reconcile my own false starts with my expectations of a Harvard student. Although things did not slow down in later years, I developed a strategy. I simply had to run twice as fast as my fastest speed, which for better or worse is much slower than that of most Harvard students. But the questions raised during my Harvard career are even more important than the pace of life. Everywhere there seemed to be a hookah smoking caterpillar asking, who are you? I often had no good answers to this question. Along with my changing accent, my views on personal and societal issues were in a constant state of flux. In the US Census, should I call myself black slash African American, or should I check the other box? Should I share the Coney 2012 video or instead point out the many other pertinent issues on the African continent and indeed the rest of the world? Should I watch the Red Sox game with my friends or finally confess my disinterest in any American sport not associated with Harvard Yale Weekend or Jeremy Lin? <laughs> my identity hinged on these questions and since I couldn't always answer them decisively, it seemed I could not identify myself. I needed to strike a balance between extreme confidence in my abilities and being intimidated by impressive peers. When I heard of other people's accomplishments, my ego often shrank so fast it felt like I had drank from, an, uh, from a small Wonderland bottle, suspiciously marked, drink me. I also had to keep my ego from swelling beyond recognition. If you think dropping the H-bomb here is challenging, try East Africa, where Yale truly is an afterthought. <laughs> Thankfully, it often suffice to say I go to school in America. You go to school in America? Wow. How's Obama? <laughs> I want to come. Can you help me? It seemed like my head could never find its ideal size, if ever there was one. As my adventures in Harvard land come to a close, I have to confront Pauline from 2008. She is echoing the caterpillar's incessant question, who am I? How has Harvard shaped me? Despite all the uncertainty I have experienced, I look back on my Harvard career with a Cheshire smile. You see, unlike Alice, I did not journey alone. From the frantic rush of freshman year to the slothfulness of senior year, my family, friends, and advisors always walked with me. My friends convinced me that I was not completely batty. And when that did not work, that being batty really isn't that bad. My advisors, tutors, bosses, and TFs gave me reality checks. And after hearing about my Wonderland obsession, they'll realize they acted just in time. And of course, there's always family. To be fair, I did have two families. Sorry. 
if you can get past the identity crisis that comes with being an international student, you will discover the joys of having a loving American host family in addition to the Rwandan one that took all your nonsense growing up. As I traveled, I learned that Harvard is not the wonderland where things always work like magic. It is the wonderland where we tirelessly question the beliefs and assumptions that used to define us. A place where we try to make sense of a world that often seems quite absurd. Knowing that hard work, not magic, will solve its problems. In the process, we all learned one or two things about who we are. These are the most valuable lessons we will apply to our lives and to the people we hope to touch. Finally, if all the good-natured orations today do not inspire you to greater heights, I urge you to follow the White Queen's advice. Start believing at least six impossible things before breakfast. If you are anything like me, at least six of those things will be events that allowed you to be here today, a Harvard graduate against all odds. Dream on, Harvard class of 2012. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline, for such a moving and wonderful speech. Good afternoon, class of 2012, faculty, families, and friends. My name is Marta Bralick. I'm a proud resident of Adams House, and I'm thrilled, Adams, um, and, I'm, and I'm thrilled to be serving as your class treasurer. Today, it is my honor to introduce the Richard Glover and Henry Russell Ames Memorial Award. On June 19, 1935, Richard Glover Ames and Henry Russell Ames, brothers and Harvard students, gave their lives to save their father, who was washed overboard during a storm off the coast of Newfoundland. Every year since, the Ames Award has been given in their memory to recognize one man and one woman who have shown energy in helping others and who exhibit the same heroic character and inspiring leadership of the Ames brothers. While Harvard students are often commended for their many achievements in scholarship, athletics, and arts, this award is unique in striving to identify individuals whose outstanding contributions have not been recognized. In effect, the goal of this award is to honor the two unsung heroes of the class of 2012. This year, our selection committee received a large number of nominations from faculty and fellow seniors. The decision process was incredibly difficult, and we could not be more proud of our classmates who have made such a tremendous impact on their communities at Harvard and around the world. Before we present the awards, I'd like to ask the class of 2012 to join me in congratulating all of the nominees on their commitment to service and leadership. I invite all of the nominees for this year's Ames Award to please stand and be recognized for your achievements. time, it is my pleasure to introduce Athena Lau, class marshal, who will present the male recipient of this year's Ames Award.
Hello, everyone. My name is Athena Lau. I'm one of your class marshals this year and also a proud resident of Cabot House. It's also my honor to announce this year's male recipient of the Ames Award. This individual is a brilliant student, dedicated leader, and a courageous advocate for social change. His social studies professors, masters in Dudley House, and fellow students look to him as a role model and an inspiration to the Harvard community. This individual has shown extraordinary courage throughout his time at Harvard. He galvanized his personal experiences, including coming out as transgender, into an unparalleled commitment to social justice at the intersections of race, gender, and sexual orientation on campus. He served in an impressive number of leadership roles in organizations on campus. In particular, he has been an advocate for Harvard's BGLTQ community. He has served as co-chair of Queer Students and Allies, staffed the Queer Resource Center, and co-founded GLOW, Harvard's first intercultural LGBTQ group for students of color. As one of three student representatives on the college working group on BGLTQ student life, this individual served as a crucial link between administration and students in conducting searches for the new Assistant Dean of Student Life and first director of BGLTQ Student Life and composing recommendations to improve LGBTQ resources on campus. In addition to his extraordinary leadership abilities, this individual has proved himself to be a force academically as a John Harvard Scholar and a member of Phi Beta Kappa. This year, he completed a senior thesis on the legal rights and benefits afforded to individuals seeking refugee status in the US and Canada due to discrimination based on sexual orientation. After college, this person will spend a year as a Frederick Sheldon Traveling Fellow before entering Yale Law School. So please join me in congratulating this amazing individual and this year's male Ames Award recipient, Jonas Wang. Congratulations, Jonas. Uh, and now Victoria Migdal will present the female recipient of this year's Ames Award. Good afternoon, class of 2012. My name is Victoria Migdal, and I am the Elliott House representative to the Senior Class Committee. Floriet Domus de Elliott. <laughs> Throughout her time at Harvard, this year's female recipient of the Ames Award known as the Big Sister of African Students at Harvard, has brought awareness of Africa's problems to the student body and worked tirelessly to help solve these problems. She is a member and leader of numerous organizations on campus, including the Harvard African Students Association, Harvard AIDS Coalition, and Harvard Students for the Horn, just to name a few. In her freshman year, she helped raise $4,000 for victims of the cholera outbreak in Zimbabwe. When she found out about the terrible impact of the famine in Somalia, she organized the Sound the Horn fundraiser and helped organize a symposium to increase awareness on campus. Recently, she raised $10,000 for and helped organize the Harvard African Development Conference. Beyond her passion for activism, she also dedicates time to her passion of global health and work in the laboratory. She has witnessed firsthand the effects of HIV and AIDS and has focused the greater part of her Harvard career around addressing this disease that has so deeply affected her nation and her community. As a high research fellow, she conducted AIDS research at the largest HIV AIDS clinic in Uganda. Her work was so exemplary that she was offered a post-graduation position as project manager to improve HIV treatment outcomes in rural communities. Despite her busy schedule and being voted the hardest working senior in Elliott House, this individual always has time to help her fellow classmates. Her compassion and amazing spirit inspire others to follow in her footsteps and make a positive difference in the world. It is my utmost honor to present the 2012 Female Ames Award to Rumbi Mushabi.
a huge congratulations to both of this year's Ames Award recipients. Good afternoon. My name is Olua Damilola Akinfenwa, and I am one of the marshals of this amazing class and also a proud resident of Cabot House. <laughs> From the moment we first opened our acceptance letters to Fair Harvard, changes stared us square in the face, and we all knew it was coming. But if we are truly honest with ourselves, the change we were expecting was that in the form of growth. However, we soon realized that change involves growth's oft forgotten sister, loss. Whether the loss is of our innocence, previous relationships, or perceived academic invincibility, it subtly transforms our character. In time, we may also witness the passing of a dear friend, mentor, or family member. It is loss in the form of death that most violently shakes our world. Over one night over dinner, a friend remarked, all we have is a present, and so we must live in this now moment. And I find that these words ring especially true today. Somewhat ironically, death beckons us to wake up and live, both for ourselves and our departed loved ones. It instructs that we love and cherish our family, friends, classmates, and community deeper and more fully than ever before. Death screams to us at the top of its lungs to arise and listen to the life all around. And our task is a simple one, to just listen. Thank you. Um, we will now hear a few words from Kristen R. Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Arn. I'm the Kirkland House representative. And it is my honor to say a few words about a dear friend, Wendy Chang. At yesterday's baccalaureate, President Drew Faust talked about how lucky we are to be Harvard students and the amazing opportunities and experiences that we are afforded because of it. As she rightly expressed how lucky we are to be students here, I found myself reflecting on how lucky so many of us were to know, love, and be loved by Wendy. Wendy was the kind of person you met and instantly felt like you were supposed to know. I used to tell Wendy that she was a niche friend. Everyone had a Wendy niche, and they were simply waiting for her to walk into their life so she could finally fill the place in their heart that they didn't even know existed until she showed up. It's difficult to pin down exactly what drew people to Wendy so easily, but it's certainly not from lack of choices. Perhaps it was because, with Wendy, everything was suddenly funnier or more interesting. She made even routine occasions, like studying in the dining hall or sitting by the river, feel special. She was brave enough to be exactly the kind of person she wanted to be, and she inspired you to do the same. Wendy was elegant, compassionate, loyal, and sincere. But perhaps most of all, we loved Wendy so much because she had an incredible power to make us feel truly cared for. In an environment where it's so easy to rush through your day, wrapped up in your own resume updates, papers, and personal life, Wendy always made time for her friends, and in doing so, managed to do what so many of us don't. Wendy was present in both her heart and her mind. In a class day speech Wendy submitted for today, Wendy wrote, we know that we will carry Harvard and the people we've met here with us for the rest of our lives. And no matter how uncertain the future looks from here, the view is always better when you're among friends. Thanks to Wendy, we will always have that friend. Her devilish sense of humor, vivacious personality, and loving presence will live on in the hearts of all of us. As a class of 2012, we walk out with one less person than we walked in with, but so much better, lucky in fact, for having had her. Please, Please join, join us in, in a, a moment, moment of silence, silence for Wendy. Wendy.
Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Alcorta, and I'm the Cabot House representative to the Senior Class Committee. It is my great pleasure to introduce our female Ivy orator, Jacqueline Rossi. Jacqueline hails from Newport Ritchie, Florida, and is proud to call Kirkland House her second home. A history concentrator, she completed her thesis on the 1938 Venice Film Festival. She served as an active member of the Harvard Radcliffe Dramatic Society, working on numerous productions. Her two most memorable productions, including Acting in Schiller's Mary Stewart and Woody Allen's Play It Again, Sam. For two years, she served as the president of the Sunken Garden Children's Theater, a group of Harvard students who performed for children in the Cambridge area. She also worked for Harvard student agencies. After college, Jacqueline plans to continue to culture her talent for the dramatic arts and pursue a career in acting. She would like to express a special thanks to her family and friends who haven't started ignoring her yet. Her speech entitled, Enter to Grow in Weirdness, celebrates Harvard's unique assortment of unconventional behavior. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our female Ivy orator, Jacqueline Rossi. Congratulations, Harvard class of 2012. You have officially learned how to think, but you have no idea how to apply it. That's because here at Harvard, practical skills and personal hygiene are replaced with the pursuit of wisdom. Wisdom is one of the key qualities this great institution cultivates, along with diversity and Asians. As the less prominent Dexter Gate tells us, we as Harvard students enter to grow in wisdom. And over the past four years, we have indeed grown in wisdom through age, scholarship, and personal experience. With age, we learned that alcohol is a gateway drug to fun. <laughs> With scholarship, we learned that BSing is not just a skill, but an art form. And with personal experience, we learned that if he dresses well, he dances well, and he dated me freshman year, ladies, he's gay. <laughs> The knowledge we gain here at Harvard is not just for party tricks and mindless small talk, like, did you know that the mechanism that enables you to flush your toilet is called a ball cock? I just said ball cock in front of Barney Frank, twice! <laughs> no. The knowledge we gain here is for, as the back of the Dexter Gate tells us, to serve better thy country and thy kind. With these degrees, we become the modern wise men, and the world looks up to us to solve the problems of our time. We are expected to become the cat's pajamas of people, using our big brains for selfless academic pursuits, like opening an orphanage, curing cancer, or playing in the NBA. <laughs> but. If you're anything like me, these expectations can make you feel like a freshman boy, scared, sweaty, and unable to perform. <laughs> and for me personally, I'm not sure that I'm ready to become a wise man. These lady parts are all I know. <laughs> anyway. We can't escape these expectations. Our parents are expecting this investment to pay off. Our friends are expecting to be interviewed for our E! True Hollywood stories. And the Crimson's expecting to make bank when they blackmail us with those pictures from Primal Scream. <laughs> yes, we've had four years of intense preparation with classes like 
Women and Gender Studies 202. Can a person have a uterus and a brain? Or Science of the Emotional Universe 18. I have mass and take up space, but do I matter? <laughs> Harvard prepared us not only academically, but for the real world as well. I mean, we now know that food is free, cars will always stop for us, and public urination and cross-dressing are encouraged and invaluable traditions. But when I think about segueing from an undergraduate to a graduate, yes, I'll be the one riding a segue to receive my diploma. I can't help but think there is still so much we have to learn. I mean, are we really ready to join the ranks of wise men past, like Confucius, Albert Einstein, and the lady who wrote Everybody Poops? Probably not, considering that half the men I know at Harvard think girls don't poop. But then again, when we think about it, what is it about these wise men that make them so inspirational? I mean, take Sir Isaac Newton, for example. Yeah, sure, he inves invented physics, but he was surprised when an apple tree fell on his head while he was sitting under an apple tree. Or what about the three wise men? I mean, who brings myrrh to a baby? How insensitive. If, if Dumbledore existed in real life, people would probably give him spare change and then apologize for the Vietnam War. And if Yoda got accepted to Harvard, he would spend the majority of his time in the writing center. And if King Solomon were still alive, he would definitely be in prison for attempted infanticide. So what, maybe being a wise man means making a few mistakes, being a little bit of a weirdo, and in some cases, threatening the lives of children. But it's through these alternative qualities that these men stood out and they were able to change the world. Take, for example, the great men of history like Karl Marx, Mark Twain, or Abraham Lincoln, who altered history forever with their trend-setting facial hair. Or Plato, who changed childhood forever, not with his nonsensical rantings, but through his invention of the pliable dough we enjoyed as children. <laughs> we remember these wise men often not just because of their academic achievements, but because of their other laughable oddities humorous handicaps, and occasional moral oversights. Sure, Sir Isaac Newton invented applesauce, and Gregory Mankiw invented boring. <laughs> but they weren't perfect. And here at Harvard, guess what? We're not perfect either. But my friends, don't cower in the face of imperfection. Relish in the fact that here at Harvard, you too are aesthetically and socially challenged, lacking in common sense and in many cases, moral convictions. But your eccentricities and societally deemed failings, i.e. your B minus in human sexuality, make you more like a wise man than anything else. Because yes, the wise man is smart and changes the world, but completes this task while being absolutely ridiculous. So even if you wake up next to a half-eaten sandwich in your bed from the night before, and then you proceed to eat it, or you took the tea five stops in the wrong direction, or you actually attended an Act 10 lecture, these mistakes don't deny you access to the world of the wise. Rather, they make your life a joke that everyone can laugh at, like Buddha's belly or Steven Pinker's haircut. So. If your goal is, in fact, to make the world a better place, one smile at a time, don't lose your dopiness, your nerdiness, or your pretentiousness that comes with a Harvard degree. Because we're all laughing at you and feeling better about ourselves. If Dexter Gate were still alive today, <laughs> I think he'd agree. Here at Harvard, to serve better thy country and thy kind, we really enter to grow in our weirdness. So friends, 
stop thinking about fulfilling expectations and becoming some hyperbolized version of a wise man here to solve all of the world's problems. Instead, take pride in your lack of practical skills, knowing that every time you fail or do something stupid, somebody out there is happy you did. <laughs> and eventually, after enough mistakes and unrelenting laughter, you'll find yourself an old, wise Harvard graduate who changed the world by just being your weird self. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lavinia Mitroy, proud representative of Leverett House, the biggest and essentially best house. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing to you this year's male Ivy orator, Matthew Whitaker. Matt is a history concentrator with a secondary field in music from New York City, but for the past three years, he has called Winthrop House home. At Harvard, Matt has worked for Let's Go and Harvard Student Agencies and contributed his musical talents to our community by playing the French horn in a handful of music groups on campus. But a large portion of his time here was spent involved with the Hasty Pudding Theatricals, for which he co-produced HPT 163, Cashmere Can, and co-authored HPT 164, There Will Be Flood. A fellow HPT member said about Matt, his role as a leader, creative force, and friend have made a lasting impact on the pudding experience. Matt's oration, There's Something About John Harvard, combines his interest in history with a unique brand of wit. Please join me in welcoming Matt. Good afternoon. Although there are nearly 1,600 graduating members of the class of 2012, there is one individual whose name we are celebrating today above all others, John Harvard. The man, the myth, the legend, but not the savage. <laughs> we have so many unanswered questions about John Harvard. What made this man so important, you might ask if you are a historian? What makes this guy think he's more important than me? You might ask if you took math 55 as a freshman. <laughs> what was John Harvard's name? You might ask if you took Xbox 10 as a freshman. <laughs> Unfortunately, we know very little about our college's namesake, whom we imagine to sit across the yard on his bronze throne steeped in history and urine. <laughs> we don't even know what he looked like, since the man depicted in the John Harvard statue is not actually John Harvard. That's a fact you can learn from any fun, peppy Crimson Key Tour guide, or one of their unmistakably shrill counterparts from unofficial tours. We don't know if John Harvard possessed the verbal mastery of T.S. Eliot, the groundbreaking ingenuity of Bill Gates, or the dashing good looks of Bill Gates. <laughs> All we can be certain that John Harvard possessed was a 300-volume vo collection of books and an estate worth at least 780 pounds, which is the amount he donated to a newly established Massachusetts college upon his death in 1638. That's it? 780 pounds? That's just pocket change to those of you who have absurdly overpaid jobs like corporate consultant or dean of the Office of Student Life. <laughs> <clears throat> but alas, our university is named for the English minister John Harvard simply because he donated his books and 780 pounds. So, what would John Harvard say if he could come back to life today just to see what his dying contribution has done for his name? Crikey, he might say if he were Australian, which he was not. 
But seriously, imagine how it would feel to learn that over nearly four centuries, your own name had become synonymous with scholarly brilliance, elite exclusivity, and what Webster's Dictionary defines as not getting any. <laughs> to find out that you had become a global brand name like Johnson & Johnson or Blue Ivy Carter, how would one react to all this? I am sure that John Harvard would be honored to see his name printed on the resumes and sweatshirts of the world's most promising geniuses. After all, we are all geniuses. <laughs> Each and every one of us was valedictorian of our high school class. We all have an IQ of 300 billion. <laughs> We've all achieved local glory in our hometown newspapers, right? Well, getting accepted to Harvard certainly landed me on the front page of my hometown paper, the New York Times. <laughs> John Harvard would also be excited that the yard named for him has become an international tourist destination. Why wouldn't he be excited about that? What's not to love about all those tourists? Take it from somebody who lived on the first floor of Stoughton. You don't even need to set an alarm clock when you can be awoken every day by a Korean family taking photos of you sleeping. <laughs> But what would John Harvard say about the more controversial issues on campus? Would he be embarrassed to see how the school name for him was portrayed in films like The Social Network? And speaking of The Social Network, how confused John Harvard might be to learn that his name is associated with the world's most popular stalking platform? I can just hear him asking, what exactly is Facebook? How do I untag all these photos? And who is this Luis Martinez that keeps writing on my wall? <laughs> Yet ultimately, I think that John Harvard would mainly feel a humble sense of pride to be here today, looking at the promising young adults <coughs> whose education he endowed from a distance. After all, John Harvard donated to this school so he could contribute to others not to boast his own achievements. In fact, he didn't have many achievements to boast. By the time he left his historic donation, John Harvard was only 30 years old. How crazy is that? The only thing I can hope to donate by the time I turn 30 is sperm. <laughs> That's not even a joke. It's currently my only prospect for paying rent next year. <laughs> But you know, at least I'm following my dreams, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want us to consider, though, how ironic it is that Harvard is named for somebody who contributed more than he achieved. We are a student body that seems singularly focused on achieving things for ourselves, and we frequently use Harvard's name as a benchmark for those personal achievements. And yet, we Harvard students so rarely make any effort to contribute to others, not even to purchase a paper from the spare change news guy. Young lady, <laughs> young man, well, hello, young man, <laughs> young lady. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it is my profound belief that we should not and must not achieve without contributing. We already have followed John Harvard's example through contributions we've made to our campus, our peers, and our friends. And we will continue to follow his example with contributions we'll make long after tomorrow when we commence our freshman year in the real world. Our contributions don't have to be monetary like John Harvard's was. These contributions might rather surface through scientific breakthroughs artistic creations, humanitarian acts, or hilariously high-profile incidents of plagiarism and identity fraud. So, within the class of 2012, whose name will still be remembered in 375 years from now, when tenured professors have been replaced by robots, and the shuttle does not take you to the quad, but rather 
to the moon, <laughs> where Harvard will need to build new dorms because construction in Austin will still be incomplete. <laughs> I hope that we will continue to not only remember those who achieved, but those who contributed. So, fellow classmates, when you take your final steps around this great yard, please take a moment to stop at the John Harvard statue. And before you unzip your pants to pee on that thing one last time, <laughs> say, thank you, John Harvard. Thank you. Congratulations to the families and graduates of the class of 2012. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew De Silva, and I'm a marshal for the class of 2012. And my name is Francisco Mislicki, and I'm the representative from Winthrop House. With a diverse range of comedic talents, our guest speaker has established himself as a captivating and hilarious entertainer through his work in film and television, most notably as a cast member in Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live for the past seven years. Several films featuring our guest speaker have titles representing some of the emotions we feel as our time at Harvard comes to a close. Parents, for example, will be proudly repeating the name of his upcoming film, That's My Boy, as they watch us receive our diplomas. No phrase captures the nostalgia and bromance we have developed for our friends and blockmates like his 2009 film, I Love You, Man. And some of you in the recent weeks have articulated the name of his 2011 film, What's Your Number, either out of genuine need or romantic desperation. You know, come to think of it, our guest speaker's Emmy Award-winning SNL digital shorts kind of parallel the class of 2012's Senior Week events very closely. Well, we had the Moonlight Cruise. Our guest speaker had I'm on a Boat. Then we had Last Chance Dance. He had I Just Had Sex. And finally, we had Senior Soiree. I just had sex. <laughs> Clearly, our guest speaker understands what it's like to be a Harvard student. So without further ado, our 2012 Class Day guest speaker, Andy, Andy Samberg. Sorry. What happened there? That song is just so emotional. I just met that guy. Oh. All right, I'm gonna just have to compose myself. The show must go on here. Uh, um. Students, faculty, parents, grandparents, Uncles that weren't invited but showed up anyway. <laughs> Handsome young janitors who are secretly math geniuses. <laughs> and the homeless guy from With Honors. My name is Andy Sandberg, and I am as honored to be here today as I am unqualified. <laughs> There's a storied history of incredible Class Day speakers here at Harvard. Nobel Prize laureate Mother Teresa, former U.S. President Bill Clinton, and now me, <laughs> the fake rap wiener songs guy. <laughs> I'm also just over the moon to be receiving an honorary degree here today. I mean, <laughs> never in my wildest dreams did I, what's that? No degree? <laughs> so what, I'm just like, I'm just like a professor or, <laughs> oh, nothing. 
then why am I here? <laughs> Dean Hammonds? Yes. You lied to me. <sighs> All right, well, that's just this crappy speech then. Here I, I flew my folks in. Here we go. Class of 2012, you are graduating from college. That means this is the first day of the last day of your life. No, that's wrong. <laughs> this is the last day of the first day of school. Nope, that's worse. <laughs> uh, this is a day. <clears throat> You know, I too turned to Webster's Dictionary and uh, it defined Harvard as the season for gathering crops. <laughs> and admittedly, that's actually the definition of harvest, but it was the closest word I could find to Harvard that wasn't a proper noun. And in the end, isn't that what Harvard is really about though? Planting the seeds of knowledge that eventually produce crops, AKA money. <laughs> in order to satisfy the farmers, your parents, who pay like 45,000 crops a year to send you to harvest, just so you could major in women's agriculture. You see what I'm doing. Before we move on, uh, the world outside of Harvard has asked me to make a, a quick announcement. The following majors are apparently useless as of tomorrow. History, literature, all things related to art, social studies, East Asian studies, pretty much anything that ends with studies, uh, romance languages, and uh, finally, folklore and mythology. <laughs> Come on, guys. Just study something useful and play World of Warcraft in your free time, okay? Anyhow, all those majors now useless unless you can somehow turn them into an iPhone app. Uh, math and science majors, you guys are cool. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> but 2012 is a great time to be graduating from college. Sure, the job market's a little slow. Sure, our healthcare and social security systems are gonna evaporate in five years. Sure, you'll have to work till you're 80 to support your 110-year-old parents who will live forever because of nanotechnology. <laughs> sure, the concept of love will soon disappear, leaving us all lonely robots ready to kill our best friend for a lukewarm cup of microchip soup. But that doesn't matter, because tomorrow you graduate from Harvest. Harvard, from Harvard, <laughs> is where you will graduate. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are looking up here and thinking, what makes this guy so special? You know, what has he accomplished? He didn't even go to Harvard. Well, to you, I say this. I didn't even apply to Harvard, okay? Because I knew I wouldn't get in. Boom, suck on that. I don't accept you, esteemed college. I break up first. I move on and you see me with my hot new girlfriend and she's riding shotgun in my convertible Sebring. That's right, it's the one that Harvard was always begging me to rent when we went up the coast and I'm just laughing and looking really fit like, has he been hitting the gym? Nope, just eating right and making positive choices. <laughs> Man, I really wanted that honorary degree. <laughs> well, I guess the old saying is true, never trust Dean Hammonds. <laughs> Regardless, Harvard remains iconic in our culture. One thing that sticks out in my mind is the central role this campus played in one of the most important films ever made about social connections and how we communicate. <clears throat> I'm referring, of course, to 1986 whimsical blackface romp, Soul Man, starring C. Thomas Howell as a white student posing as an African-American in order to exploit affirmative action. He was in Harvard Law in that movie, and that movie exists. 
Now, most of you don't know this yet, but Harvard is one of the few schools you can attend that can also eventually become your workplace nickname. Whose edamame is this in the break room? Probably Harvard's. <laughs> Whose Vespa's in my parking spot? Uh, I'm going with Harvard's. In fact, once you graduate, you can never wear your Harvard sweatshirt in public again without looking like a world-class a-hole. <clears throat> I honestly think the Coop should sell University of Michigan t-shirts that you can wear just to blend in once you're out of here. And to clarify, when I say the Coop, I mean your campus bookstore and not famous film actor Bradley Cooper, whom I also refer to as the Coop, and who also sells books and sweatshirts in his free time. Speaking of fame, Harvard has many famous alumni, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, just a few ex-students that started successful businesses after dropping out, which means if you're in this crowd today and graduating, you're destined to be a massive failure. <laughs> Sorry, those are just the facts. Also a fact, class day is a terrible name for a day when you don't have to go to class. <laughs> like ever again. It's pretty much like calling New Year's Eve sobriety night. <laughs> hey, you going out for sobriety night? Yeah, it's going to suck. <laughs> and now on a more literary note, I'd like to read a poem by the great W.B. Yeats, which is actually pronounced Yeats. A lot of people don't know that. Thanks for the heads up, Barney Frank. <laughs> Anyways, this is a truly beautiful and poignant passage from the 1929 collection, The Winding Stair and Other Poems, and I think it's especially applicable to today's ceremonies. <clears throat> it goes like this. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. It's Friday night and I feel all right. Hit the shore, cause I'm faded. Honey's in the streets, say money, yo, we made it. There's more, but you get it. Classic Eats. <laughs> An important poet. <clears throat> now, while I am truly excited to be here today, I'll be honest, at 33 years of age, I haven't endured or lived that much more than you guys. So, in order to give you a broader scope of what's to come, I reached out and asked for some words of wisdom from some people that I thought were relevant to your experience here. Uh, the aforementioned Mark Zuckerberg, who was a Harvard student, was kind enough to send me some remarks that I will relate to you now. <clears throat> uh, hey guys, it's me, Mark. Uh, or as my friend Kofi Annan calls me, Zuckleberry Finn. <laughs> he thought of that. I just wanted to give a quick congrats to you all, but really, more of a congrats to me. You know, since I left, things have gone so good, you guys. Like a six-year-old's fantasy of the future good. Uh, in fact, I recently completed the Harvard trifecta. Start your own company, have a movie made about you, and marry an Asian doctor. Trifecta! <laughs> so everyone out there, be sure to upgrade to Timeline and lay off the Pinocchio's pizza. <laughs> I went to Harvard! <laughs> That's what he had to say. Uh, I also asked for you know, the local experience. I asked Massachusetts native Mark Wahlberg to send over some thoughts for you guys. And uh, here's what he had to say. <clears throat> hey, Harvard, how's it going? <laughs> so you guys are graduating, huh? I think that's great. Hey, we should do a film together, what do you think? You guys are super smart, right? I used a prosthetic penis and boogie nights. Okay, just think about it. Say hi to your mother for me, okay? He asked me to say that to you guys. And then finally, I asked block blockbuster superstar Nick Cage for some remarks. Now, I realize he didn't go to Harvard and he's not from Boston but he has a special connection to this place that I'll let him explain. Here's what he wrote. <clears throat> Good afternoon. 
As I write to you, I'm currently digging a tunnel into the bowels of the Widener Library. <laughs> when I finally breach its mighty walls, I will steal the legendary Gutenberg Bible and return it to its rightful owner, Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> you know, I've seen some weird stuff in my day. In Istanbul, I saw a small child swallow a pelican whole. In the Sahara Desert, I saw a herd of oxen fly into a portal and disappear from our world forever. But no matter what I've seen, there's been one thing I've held to be true. Love is the most powerful force this universe has to offer, and we should show kindness to all around us, with the exception of Dean Hammonds, who is a filthy liar! <laughs> And that, my friends, is the true meaning of Hanukkah. <laughs> I'd love to keep writing, but now the time has come for me to ride on to my next adventure. What's that, you ask? Simple. I'm gonna have sex with the statue of John Harvard. <laughs> and those are my three impressions. <laughs> Thank you, you guys. Late night television led me straight here. Uh, now, we've been paying a lot of attention to the students here today, but I want to take a moment and acknowledge all the parents. In particular, I want to give a shout out to all the moms in the house. Give it up. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, our moms, our moms put up with so much and they ask for so little. And as I look out at all the beautiful mothers here today, I can't help but be filled with an overwhelming sense of horniness. Oh yes, you're a fine crop indeed. And I likes me some older ladies. They know how to do stuff, if you know what I mean. So to all the moms, open invitation. Nobody gots to know about it. Now, before all you dads out there get upset, I mean, no, dis no disrespect, really, and you gotta be something special if you've got such fine ladies on your arms. In fact, as I look out at all these strong, loyal men, I can't help but be filled with an overwhelming sense of horniness. <laughs> oh, yes. See a lot of silver foxes out there today. And Harvard ain't cheap where my sugar daddy's at. Yeah, I see you. You don't have to raise your hand. Open invitation, gentlemen. Nobody gots to know. <clears throat> and now I'd like to get a little serious. As you move forward in the world, there will be obstacles. But every challenge is a chance for success. You know what, I'm sorry, I had a whole inspirational section of this prepared, but it just feels phony now. So I'm gonna scrap these scripted words and, and just speak to you guys from the heart. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, this stuff is much more from the heart. Look, the things I'm about to say to you aren't to make any friends. And they're not for some cheap applause, okay? It's real talk, and it comes from my soul, so listen up. Yale sucks balls! Am I right? Cheer if I'm right! Oh, they're the worst! <laughs> uh, Yale asked me to do their class day speech, but I couldn't make it to the stage because I kept slipping in all their drool. It's like a second-tier safety school in the worst city in America. <laughs> Guys, I'm kidding. New Haven's nicer now. Then Rwanda. <laughs> Little known fact about Yale, it was built on top of an ancient Native American toilet. I mean, it's no wonder they're called the Bulldogs. They're a bunch of big-headed inbreds with breathing problems. <laughs> and that comes with my apologies to any inbreds here today. Don't let anyone compare you to a Yaley. And look, this all might sound harsh, 
But in truth, Yale is basically a sewer filled with mole people. <laughs> Only replace the word people with stinky, dried up dog turds that hate laughter and puppies. <laughs> and that's my heart stuff, you guys. <laughs> From my soul. For some of you, it might have been tough to hear, but I felt it was my duty to give it to you straight. Also, quick confession, I know literally nothing about Yale. But I will say this, Dartmouth can burn in hell. <laughs> ah, class day. You know, it's hard to know where life will take you from here, what adventures you'll have, which sitcoms you'll write for, but my advice to you is simple. Relax, dude. You just finished college at Harvard. You worked so hard. Trust me, you're gonna kill it. I went to Santa Cruz, and then I transferred to film school, and I'm rich, <laughs> okay? And I don't mean spiritually rich or any hippie crap like that. I'm talking about racks on racks. <laughs> Believe it. I'm being a little hyperbolic to seem cool, but I am up against Mother Teresa on this thing, okay? Have you guys YouTubed her class day speech? She was like crumping and throwing bags of money into the crowd. I'm gonna take some liberties. But in the days ahead, a lot of people will tell you to trust your instincts and don't be afraid to take chances. And I am definitely one of those people. But I would also say this, don't rush into the next phase of your life. Whether it's grad school at Harvard or grad school at MIT or massively disappointing your parents by exploring your art made out of garbage thing. <laughs> Whatever it is you try, make sure it's what you really want to do, because the only person who knows what that is, is you. And if all else fails, just remember these beautiful words from the film Dead Poets Society. Neil! <laughs> My Neil is dead! My boy! Which, now that I've said out loud, did not quite drive home my point as much as I had hoped. In fact, I'm realizing that only like 7% of what I've said today has been at all helpful, or even passable as English. But in the end, I feel I'm only truly qualified to give you three simple tips on how to succeed in life. One, cut a hole in a box. Two, put your junk in said box. Three, make her or him open the box. And that's the way you do it. Also, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but Dean Hammonds, I forgive you. Bygones be bygones. I've already got that sweet degree from Santa Cruz and film school anyway. So thank you, graduates. Godspeed and congratulations. Play the Yeats! Thank you, Andy. Uh, I feel like I'm going to have a lot to explain to my grandmothers after that. <laughs> my name is Colin Jones. I am the Quincy House representative. That's what I'm talking about. We now have the opportunity to hear from a group of seniors who have written this year's class ode. Every year, a senior or a group of seniors write a new class ode to be performed at class day to the tune of Fair Harvard. This year's class ode was written by Glenn Townsend Bogardis, Edward Daniel, Rachel Langston Hawkins, Jennifer Christine Hopi, Elizabeth Rose Maroney, and Duncan Joseph Watts, all members of the Harvard University Band. In case you couldn't tell. Edward Daniel, Rachel Hawkins, Duncan Watts, Glenn Bogardis, and Ruth Mental will be leading the class ode. Please stand and sing along. Those storm through us, rose out. 
Thank you. I'll ask you to sit one last time. I know all of you, all of you graduating seniors were thinking, wow, I really need to learn Fair Harvard before I graduate. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Lang Luntow. I'm a proud resident of Kirk... <laughs> well, hello. Um, I'm a proud resident of Kirkland House. Great. I'm your second class marshal, and I am terrified that it's my job to have the last word today. Um, after hearing such engaging speakers, there's an immense pressure to say something profound, but instead, I'll say something quick, because I can see that people are already leaving, and that's what you would want. Now, I have an agenda with these closing words, and I'd like to make it clear from the start. You've all spent enough time listening to these wonderful speakers on this stage, and I intend to wrap things up with speed. In addition, I promised all my blockmates that I'll buy them beers tonight if I go over three minutes, and I hope that one of them is keeping time. When I think about what's defined my experience over the last four years, I'm reminded of a conversation I once had with a tutor in Kirkland House, in which he compared Harvard students to onions. We have layers and layers of identity and talent and passion, he said, but they only become visible in time. It's often difficult to sit us down when we're running from classes to extracurriculars to our many social engagements, but he told me that the favorite part of his job is discovering these hidden things that make us exceptional. Likewise, Harvard students are, for me, are always surprising. Just when I think I'm beginning to understand what defines one of you, you reveal another hidden interest or experience that enriches my understanding of the kind of person you are. In particular, I'd like to highlight the students that are championing Launch 2012, a new social innovation platform, and they'd like me to announce that over a thousand seniors have voted to choose education as their class cause. I depart feeling as if I've only witnessed a fraction of what all of you are capable of, and I'm excited to see what you all do in the next few years. Because this is the one, one of the last times we'll all be together as undergraduates on our own, I'd like to end our class day exercises with a simple expression of thanks. Thank you for sharing the last four years of your lives with me and for investing in our community. Thank you for inspiring and surprising me and supporting each other. As Bonnie mentioned at the beginning of this afternoon, it's difficult, it's difficult to explain what it feels like to be a member of this community. But I'll say this, you've all helped me remain an optimist given me hope that the problems that face our generation are solvable and have built my faith that working together we can have a meaningful impact on the world. So from this point, you have around 48 hours until your Harvard IDs will stop working. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be too real, but 
On Friday afternoon, you'll stuff your things into minivans and carry-on bags, you'll say your goodbyes, and then depart to some distant or not so distant place to pursue your bliss. In the remaining time that you have here, you'll have to make some decisions. You could reminisce with friends over wine on the bank of the Charles, or Froyo at Berry Line. You could sit up late, revisiting inside jokes from your house courtyard, or you could spend the last night thinking by yourself, reflecting on how you've changed and grown in the past four years, what you thought you'd become, and how you've stacked up. Whatever you do, I do have one request, that you also take some time in the next two days to thank the people in your life, many of them sitting to your left and right, who have impacted you, who have helped you grow, and who have shaped your time here. So to all of you, I say thank you. See you all tomorrow morning, and once again, congratulations. Yeah, wait, can I? Can, okay, gonna I feel like Matt should, Matt should take this.